The following information you are about to hear will describe gruesome acts of violence. Viewer discretion is advised. I'm here to bring attention to ongoing conflicts internationally that are on par with genocide or have been proven to be genocidal. In the ongoing conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it has its roots in the aftermath of the 1994 Rwandan genocide, where millions of Rwandan refugees fled into Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, leading to clashes between the M23 and allied democratic forces, the EDF. They continue to perpetrate violence, causing a severe humanitarian crisis. Over the past three decades, this cyclical conflict has resulted in millions of deaths and widespread displacement, even today. The ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine has led to significant loss of life, with more than 13,000 children who have been killed, with presumed 12,000 dead and 71,000 injured. Additionally, 70% of residential areas in Gaza have been destroyed. While there is no evidence of mass killings in Xinjiang, China, there are alleged sterilization measures and efforts to prevent births which have amounted to genocidal intent. There is also evidence of crimes against humanity, torture, and sexual violence against the Uyghur people. And staying informed about genocides is crucial for empathy and fostering awareness and advocating for justice. I wanna hear your thoughts, I wanna hear your sound, and mama always told me to shout, and speak my mind out loud. Come on and talk when you got the time, freedom once you on the line, we wanna hear from you. You gotta go and let your voice shine, platform yours is not just mine, we wanna hear from you. You gotta go and talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Hey y'all, what's up? It's your boy Douglas, or you could call me Freedom. Welcome to my channel. Before we get started, make sure that you guys like this video, comment below this video, share this video, and subscribe to my channel because you need me. This is season three, episode 10 of my podcast. As I say always, forgive my background and forgive my brother. I know, I know, I wasn't able to really be consistent with the podcast episodes, but it's okay because I'm back now and voila, your boy released his first project ever. If you haven't already, make sure to check out Freedom Savage, the mixtape. The link will be in the description below. And without further Further ado, I think we could get started. Hey y'all, so we are in our first segment, Freedom of Speech. I got three lovely ladies with me. My name's Deborah. Uh, she her pronouns, and yeah, y'all seen me before. It's been a little minute, but you know I'm back in the mix, ready to give the girls the tea, ready to talk. Same thing, y'all seen me and Tati. I renamed my um Zoom, so you can follow me on Instagram as well. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Kina, and it's really nice to be here, and I feel very happy to be here. So my pronouns are going to be she, her. So my Instagram is Kina Dowdy, K-E-N-A-D-O-W-D-Y. Oh, per, she said it real fast. Oh, <laughs> Instagram, uh, Y-A underscore G-U-R-L underscore D-B-Z, your girl Debs. You know who it is. Go follow a bitch. Thank y'all. The main topic that I want to discuss with you guys, something that has been a debate all over social media for the last couple of weeks. There was this teacher, Black man. He went on TikTok or TikTok Live, or probably he just made a TikTok. I'm not sure. Actually, why am I doing this when I know I got the little link right here? I'm going to read it for y'all. And this is coming from BlackEnterprise.com, okay? A popular TikToker who uses the platform to vlog his teaching adventures is getting mixed reactions to his in-classroom hair session with his female students. According to the educator who goes by Jack Lee, I hope I'm saying that right, he decided to live stream, okay, so it was a TikTok live, a group of his students unbraiding his hair ahead of his scheduled hair appointment at a hair salon. As 
After live streaming the experience, Lee was uh, well aware of the mixed responses. To keep the conversation going, Lee decided to share a sped up version of what happened on the TikTok page, where he asked his 650,000 followers to comment your thoughts. So he, I didn't even know he purposely made it to where people could, you know, give their opinion on it. That's Interesting. Anyway, so he got a lot of mixed reviews. Some people were like, okay, this is a problem. Some people were like, uh, this is not a problem. Whatever the hell, I guess the school thought it was because he got fired. So, and he ended up making a response TikTok. How do y'all all feel about the situation? Deborah, we could go with you first. Okay, I definitely feel that definitely wasn't the most professional thing to do, but I don't think it was inappropriate. I don't think that he did it with the intentions of like, you know, being inappropriate at all, because it's not, they're just taking their hair down. Now, would you do that with any regular teacher? Most likely, no. You're only going to do that with somebody that you have a closer bond with. But I just feel like he kind of set himself up for this happening because he brought it to social media and he asked social media their thoughts on it. One thing you don't do is ask social media what the fuck they think about something because it's going to become a huge debate. It's not going to be like most of the time you're not going to receive the kind of response that you think, you know? So I just feel like he definitely should have thought more about what he was doing when he was filming it and stuff because he left it open for people to have a problem with it. I just feel like if that's something he did for the one time, like, cool, but you recorded it or you were on live, you know? So you you brought it to social media. I have mixed feelings about it because I don't feel like he should have been fired for it. It's so many different, and I'm not going to say, oh, other teachers do it, so why aren't they fired? But then again, it's like, yeah. Other teachers have done it, women teachers, other black teachers, other white teachers, like if we want to be, you know, real technical. So many other teachers have videos of their students playing in their hair, dyeing their hair, braiding their hair. And it's like, why is he getting the backlash of that as opposed to these other teachers? I personally feel like it's because he's a black man, to be honest, because there is a bunch of white women teachers who have students playing in their hair no backlash now let's take out the fact that okay he he has the school name in his video you know let's take out those let's just leave it as he has students playing in his hair so do other teachers and they did not get fired they did not get penalized they did not get criticized for it so it was like why did he get so much backlash and i feel like honestly it's because he's a black man and mediocre you know maybe attractive black man, you know, he's not a black, a, a man where, you know, somebody isn't that attractive. It wouldn't give them that much backlash. The fact that he's a somewhat attractive black man, he got more backlash as it being inappropriate. Some people made it sexual, even like some certain things I don't agree with, like messaging the students and things like that. Certain things I don't agree with, but the concept period, having kids playing his hair is like, it's thousands of other teachers on TikTok doing the same thing. So I don't understand why he got so, you know, penalized for that specific thing. It didn't make sense to me. I agree. And I think that if anything about it were to be sensual, then that would be a little bit different. If they were like massaging his head or his shoulders, or whatever, that would be a little different. But they're literally just unbraiding his hair. Like that's not even considered any kind of like weird sort like that's just something people do like i don't know i don't think it's that big of a deal but it also to me i think it depends on his age too maybe like like if he's like 20s or like early 30s like okay like it's not that big of a deal but like that's the only thing to me but none nothing about it being sexual i think it was fine i don't i don't i'm i wasn't against it so I think that all of his problems started when he decided to post it on the internet. <laughs> kind of taking it back to what Deborah said, there are some things that just, it like this was the last thing that needed the internet's input. And what I don't care for is the, just the whole spectacle and like just exposing the kids. Like, like that's really what's making me feel bad. I could really care less about him being you know, dragged or not dragged or talked about or in every magazine and stuff on social media. But you have students and it's kind of just like, did their parents consent to them being on camera? Like, aren't there? He said, yeah, he, when people started talking about the parents, 
he said he got consent from their parents to have them on social media, like as far as their faces. And their parents understand the relationships between the students and him. The parents actually like him as their teacher because they feel like he bonds with them. And, you know, kids learn better that way when they bond with their teachers. From a security standpoint, I don't feel like the situation was appropriate to be put online. However, you have kids that would make TikToks and stuff at school and then they're promoting the school without knowing that they're even doing it. So I don't think it was detrimental for the kids to be, you know, on social media in this scenario. But I could see why some people are like making a security argument and like a safety argument. But like you said, he got consent from the parents. So they must be aware of him making content and doing the things. They probably feel like the situation got dragged out. I mean, at the end of the day, it's their kids. So he did bring it on himself, though. I don't feel like he needed to be fired I think firing him was a little unnecessary. It was kind of like a bet he made personally for me. It's hard for me to tell whether or not this is racial. I, I, like, I, I feel like it is. I feel like it is because it was just a recent video of a white teacher. I think, actually, I think he was a principal. And it was a bunch of girls bedazzling his head. He had a bald head um, in his office. And people were like, <laughs> okay, what's the difference between this and that? I'm like... He's not a black man. And then also, I personally feel like when it comes to criticizing black people, our people as a whole will do a black person in. Like they will drag them to the ground. Not saying like, oh, if it's a guilty black person and obviously, you know, obviously they deserve whatever. But I feel like as a whole, with when it comes to black people, as far as I, my opinion, I feel like the community will drag you down a lot as opposed to the white community who always be sticking up for each other. Even if the person is dead ass wrong, they going to back up their people like like it was that too, a lot. It was a lot of people dumping their own trauma onto that saying, oh, it's sexual. Oh, it was like, you know, inappropriate. He, you know, putting it in that kind of light. I feel like that played a huge part in it too. It was actually people calling the school to get him fired. Wow. So it's like, why people not doing, not, not saying that they not doing that at all, but like other races, you know, they're not doing that with their own. You want to know something? Like I said before, I think that bringing it to social media really was just the issue because had yeah, I been he, in middle he school- He brought it on himself for bringing it on social media. Had yeah. I been in school and I saw that, I would have had me to think about it. I probably would have just kept walking or mind my yeah. Like it wouldn't mm -hmm. have been a thing to me, especially when you have cases of teachers actually being involved with students and shit, you know? <laughs> to me, that's not what that was. Being that you brought up race, I could see where you are saying that it's a race issue. I get the double standard of like the other situation you brought up with the bullheaded white guy. Um, this question <laughs> for all of you. <laughs> Did I <laughs> Do y'all feel like the situation would have been different had there been a switch in gender roles and or race? Definitely. Yes to both. I don't know who this lady is. She's I'm going to have to mute that out. But I remember she was recently in the news for getting herself involved with one of her students. And the boy was mm -hmm. like nine or seven or something. And like he had her as his wall screen, like wallpaper. And like they were sexting and like doing all of the mm. things. Remember you didn't hear about that? Like this chick was really full on involved. I've in honestly been her. hearing a, a lot of like every week I've been seeing cases with um, women teachers getting involved with their students. How does that make y'all feel and compare to this? I will stand it. I feel like because you see how they dragging this man, but the many cases of women that's having inappropriate sexual relationships with their students is not as big as this. I and agree. Taking out his hair. I agree. I just feel like they let certain things like slide when it comes to, you know, why. And, and the thing is, in that case specifically, it is 30,000 times worse. Yet it's not receiving the same attention, the same energy. It blows my mind because though I feel like he shouldn't have brought it to social media, I do feel like he's getting treated the way that he is because he is a black man. Had it been anybody else, especially too, I feel like the fact that they were sexualizing what happened was because he was a black man because people have a tendency to fetishize black men yeah and it wasn't that at all 
like but when actual sexual acts are happening it goes so swept under the rug for how long like it doesn't make sense to me what really makes me feel like race is involved was firing him not even just the social media spectacle of it all it's one of those situations where i do kind of feel like it was a double-edged sword because he sh he did bring it on himself like he purposely did this to put it online to have it be online for people to make a big deal about it like he this is what he wanted but at the same time why fire him and he his actual teaching is not a problem the students don't feel harmed um they had consent he went about things properly are people too quick to want to hop on social media for everything because i feel like that's like the big thing here immediately yes unfortunately i feel like social not unfortunately because in some ways social media is a positive thing but it has become so blended into everyday life that is like the first thing people run to when there's a crisis and when there's something important going on you know that's how people find out their news that's how people find out what's going on so in some cases it's good because we we get to know what's going on and things like that but a lot of times people post before they think and that can happen in certain situations where it's like posting stupid stuff that you know like doesn't really matter and then it, it goes into the same space of posting traumatic things posting things that could easily incriminate yourself get yourself in trouble and you don't even know you're not thinking about it you're just posting because you just want people to see it or their input or whatever but it, it's just too much i just feel like social media is overly completely oversaturated and i think that people just need to take a break back from it and kind of you know stay focused on real life like social media is a part of real life but it is not real life I feel like he wanted to show black male teachers in a positive light, but it backfired. Because you don't normally, like when you look up these teachers having students, you know, playing their hair or when it has to do with anything outside of actual learning, it's always women teachers, white women and black women. But you don't really see much interaction when it comes to black male teachers. So I guess he won. I feel like he wanted to show that in a positive light, but it didn't turn out how he thought it would. It was a really weird decision for him to post it on social media because that almost normalized it for him. Like it was a little bit too normal to him. Like how do you not know that motherfuckers are that people are gonna be on social media like coming for you? I don't know. Even like high fiving is like a little bit iffy to some people like they don't want any contact so that was like that seems like very obvious like how you don't know that that's gonna be an issue but i really don't think he had any bad intentions because he's posting it on his social media so he thinks that it's okay like he that's how you know that he didn't have any malintentions because he's like showing everybody like oh yeah like this is what we do in my class like he's showing what they do like it could have been way worse oh day i just hope he gets another teaching job because he seems like you know, a fun teacher. Like, that's the type of teacher, like, people need. Maybe we need to look at, you know, the relationship between <laughs> teachers and students differently. Um, obviously, some of them are, like, really bad, and it's, like, a little bit too much of a relationship. But in that sense, like, maybe it's okay to have a little fun sometimes. And that's what I think. It's something that people do so often um, when it comes to situations like this. But I think we forget to also kind of see how the kids feel. Like, I wish I could also kind of just like, you know, talk to the students and just really get their opinion because it's so easy to not make them a factor. And like being that he's like the focal point of everything. I think people aren't really paying attention to how the students feel about him leaving. The students feel about him, you know, having the relationship with them that he had. Things can be inappropriate without them having to be sexual, yes. But I was looking at things from a sexual landscape only because, like, I, I, th I think I'm one of many people that's that's had, like, you know, heavy crushes on their teacher. I don't want to put it, like, you know, in the atmosphere because those girls, it could have just been straight, just unbraiding his hair and nothing more. So I don't want people to think that I'm, like, creating this narrative. I, I don't know what those little girls were feeling or doing. For a person like me, it's very easy to catch feelings for someone that um kind of, like, really opens themselves up to me and makes me feel, like, hella comfortable and gives me, like... Um, 
a huge amount of respect, you know, and it's kind of just like, if one of those students, not necessarily the girls, but anybody else that could have been unbraiding his hair, really did have a crush on him, not saying that he would have, you know, entertained, like, you know, them, because that would have just did this whole conversation would have been something different. Um, but it does kind of make me feel like things could have gotten inappropriate if the kid, if that one kid did actually have a crush on you and they find touching you, they find solace in touching you and like unbraiding your hair. But then I was also thinking about it from a certain standpoint of uh, that one kid, because I don't know if every kid likes him or if every kid, you know, feels great in the, in his class. Again, I didn't, I don't watch it. I don't be on TikTok, but I don't watch his TikToks to even really know how he engages with all his students or his relationship with every single one of his students um what if it's just that one kid that's really quiet and reserved until themselves and normally just feels unacknowledged you know i feel like it would have been easy for a kid to probably even get jealous at a video like that because then they're probably thinking oh look at my two classmates you let them unbraid your hair but like what if i want to what i have been able to do it i feel like when it comes to that i think that's a whole nother then i said that takes a whole nother turn but then that's up to the teacher to you know not entertain that type of you know because when it comes to teachers especially young teachers they are also told like you know before they even start working when it comes to their age to how to react with kids how to interact with them you know especially the fact that they looked like were they in middle school or like that is the real gag of the i'm not sure how know. old they were but they look to be maybe from they look to be like early teens maybe like it's given middle school. Like it's given. Yeah, I think it was middle school. I'm not sure. I don't know. When it comes to that, I feel like that's another double standard. I was about to say and the school or a lot. They got exposed. Yeah, I didn't even look up the school, but I feel like that's another double standard because, like I said, it's a, so it's so many women teachers who do the same thing and who let children play in their hair and fix their hair, and it's like. Then you get into the deeper analytics of it. Then it's like, it could be the same thing with a woman teacher. A student could have a crush on them and it could be the same thing, you know? So I don't know. I was just, then that circles back to what I said in the first place. I feel like because he's a black man, that's when all of these things come up as far as the sexual, as far as, you know, because when it comes to the woman teachers, those thoughts don't even come into people's head. Not a man, a black man, because there are also men teachers who are doing the same thing on TikTok and stuff. But the fact that he's a black man, he has to really double down on how he interacts with his students, which I don't feel like is right. But Tati, as a parent, how would you be okay with your kids interacting with their teacher that way? And me personally, no. I don't, I mean, growing up, we've never played in our teachers here, no matter how good of a bond I have with my teacher. And I've had some teachers that I loved and they love their students. And you know, you have that one teacher, you know? We never, it was never physical. Like, and it, I'm not even saying in a sexual way, but it was never physical because they always had that boundary. I feel like now with social media, teachers want to show that they have this great bond with their kids. So they do all of these crazy ass things that you don't have to do. You can have a great bond with your students and not be physical. I've had great bonds with teachers. Like I've loved, you know, you have your favorite teachers. I never played in their hair. <laughs> like I never did it, but the most it was, was like with hug. social media. Yeah, not even a hug. Like maybe on the last day of school. Probably on the last day of school. <laughs> like, a side hug or something. Yeah, yeah like, like a little side like hug you, or something. But, yeah, like you said, heavy on the boundaries though. I just feel like, mm -hmm. especially in today's day and age, we just need to be very much more sensitive. Like there's a lot going on in this world. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of really creepy people. So I feel like that's why people are tripping like that. Just because of some of the stuff that we see come to light now. You know, but that's why you just got to move carefully like it's i don't i don't feel like he was being malicious or had malintent but again you just need to move more carefully set more boundaries so that way everybody is comfortable including the parents you know because most of the time mm -hmm. the parents aren't there so if they don't hear from their kid or the teacher they're not gonna know their kid is braiding a teacher's hair yeah. you know and so even if they did have a problem with it, they probably didn't know in the moment, you know? So I just feel like this is just probably a learning lesson for setting boundaries. And at the end of the day, for understanding that 
um, the internet is not going to perceive you as the person you truly are. The internet is going to perceive you as how they see you at first glance. And mm -hmm. if all they see at first glance is a young black man, then they, you know, they might treat you that way. There are a lot of ignorant people on the internet and they take any and every situation to attack people just living their lives. Why? Because that brings them enjoyment, you know? So I just feel like it's it's really sad that that happened, but at the same time, this is this is why I said the hell off of social media because y'all y'all be oh, it. Like, not everything yeah. I mean, catch yeah. that ride all yeah. the time. No, <laughs> y'all gonna catch me once a month when I'm already gone because y'all ain't gonna tell me nothing. Y'all uh uh. Never uh -uh. was like I'll do one thing and get canceled on. <laughs> yeah, that's I, that's why I shut the fuck up because I can't. Yo, when I, I see can't. certain videos, I I seen a video earlier. It was this he was this black man. He was um he was recording him and his baby. His baby was saying "dad, dad" the first words, and his older child was in the background. He said the older child said some crazy, some stupid shit. Cause I say that because as a parent, kids be saying stupid shit. <laughs> so he, he the older child says something, and then he cursed. He's like, "The fuck you just said?" And then is all the comments is going like he was just abused the hell out that child no why would you curse at your child that way i'm like i'm reading the comments i'm like they would hate me because <laughs> i like i curse in front of my kids i curse them out like yeah i will get i will get scorched online if they ever see me scorched <laughs> But see, some people they, they can't take the real like they just expect like, come on now. No. Shit. like that shit don't work with no kids sometimes you gotta cuss them the hell out you you be hey, honest, you, he wasn't know, even like, screaming he was talking with a regular voice like because the kid cursed so he was like the hell you just said y'all yeah, so uh, not gonna get on the kid you gonna oh, get on like, the hated mama. Like, <laughs> automatically bring the parent like oh the child was probably cursing because he cursed around it like please Hey, hey, social media is never your friend. You can right. use it to your advantage, but it's definitely not your friend. Mm -hmm. At all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Freedom Savage podcast will be right back after these messages. Your girl is in her big bag. I just got into digital marketing. So if you don't know what digital marketing is, you're basically selling digital products online. So that can be like e-courses, e-books, you know, guides and everything. How I'm doing it is I sell a digital wealth guide. It's basically a whole breakdown of how to sell your own digital products, how to create your own digital products and how to brand yourself and like create an online business. When you purchase the digital wealth guide, the great part about that is that you're also purchasing master resale rights. So that means you have the ability to resell this guide with 100% profit. Now this could be for anyone. You don't need experience. You don't need to be this highly experienced, have a degree. You can create your digital products in any business that you may already have. Let's say you're a hairstylist. You know, maybe if you're a braider, you could give techniques to other braiders. Maybe if you sell wigs or bundles, you can give, you know, an ebook on the vendors that you use. You can create your own digital products to sell to your audience complete beginner you've never done it before you can resell on the digital wealth guide itself now the digital wealth guide is basically an ebook and it has so much knowledge in it on what digital products is how to brand yourself how to connect your audience on instagram and on tiktok it's basically like this whole big module that goes into depth on content creation on how to even make your own products so it's literally like a handheld step-by-step -step thing on how to do the whole thing. You do not need experience. If that's something that you're interested in and it's very good with passive income, you can still work your regular nine to five and do this on the side. It's really up to you. It's for everyone. So if that's something you're interested in, you can go to my Instagram to check it out. I'm going to be posting more information on it like every day on a day-to-day -day basis. And you could DM me. I also offer a free guide before purchasing the DWA. So you can like get a sneak peek of what it looks like and what to expect. Check on my Instagram and you can see more information about it. Do you want to get some locks or need help maintaining locks you have already? Crown Kinks got you covered. Yes, you heard that right. The goddess of locks got you covered. With Crown Kinks, it's your hair, so it's your say. And if you get a little hungry, don't even worry about it. Free snack and beverage refreshments will be provided to you. DM on Instagram at Crown Kinks to discuss pricing, bookings, consultations, and all other inquiries. All is welcome as long as respect is shown to the wonderful at-home business. As 
a proud client, I can assure you, your hair will be done with great precision and an incredible amount of care. Wait one second, we're not finished. Do you want to take home your own lock gel, lock shampoo, and rose water? Soon, Crown Kings' lock products will be in your hands in no time. Quay Gold's Beauty is a luxury business that sells essential beauty products such as lashes, lip glosses, matte lip gloss, lip scrubs, body scrubs, candles, and jewelry. Don't even let me hold you back. Go ahead and DM at Quay Gold's Beauty underscore to get your hand on the products that you need. Way back in the day, I was all up over you in school. Had me always singing your song, and you know you had a check out freedomsavagent.net to hear more. And now doing me wrong, and I closed up my and we're back. Tap in, y'all. The Freedom Savage podcast is here. The following information you are about to hear will describe gruesome acts of violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, you guys. So we are in our second segment, The Savage Court. We've been playing this for the last couple of episodes already, but basically me, Kina, and Tati are going to pretend to be judges and we are going to review cases and kind of give our own little personal verdict on what we would do if we were the judges in a case and what like theoretical verdict we would place. We are going to be diving into criminal cases. I had already put a disclaimer up before this, but uh, we will be dealing with some severe crimes. So uh, viewer discretion is advice. I think we're ready to start with our first case. In 1997, Rena Virk was a 14-year-old girl from British Columbia. She was invited to a party and never returned home because she was savagely by a group of her own peers. Rena's family had immigrated from India and converted from Hinduism to Jehovah's Witness. Rena desperately struggled with her self-esteem and wanted nothing more than to just fit in at school, and unfortunately she was terribly bullied throughout her childhood. One day she met a group of kids that she considered the cool kids. They were allowed to have more freedom, stay out late, smoking and drinking. And Rena ended up spending time in the foster system after she falsely accused her father of abuse. It was her belief that life within the system would be better than being under the rules of her parents. And her mom and dad just hoped and prayed that this was just a phase that would ultimately pass. This is Nicole Cook, and she was basically everything that Rena envied. And one day, Nicole left her phone book at Rena's house, and Rena made the decision to call a group of boys listed inside. She spread a bunch of nasty rumors about Nicole. She told them that her boobs were fake, her eyebrows were fake, and she had ass. And of course, when Nicole discovered what Rena had done, she was furious. And this was when she devised a plan of revenge. Her friend invited Rena to a gathering at the Shoreline School on November 14, 1997. The group ended up under the Craig Flower Bridge. This was when Nicole confronted Rena and actually put her cigarette out on Rena's head. And suddenly there were about eight kids swarming around Rena, attacking her. The attack lasted about a minute, and Rena was left laying at the shoreline of the water, bleeding and crying. At this point in time, most of the group dispersed and many ran away. Nobody stepped in to see if Rena was okay. Rena managed to stand up and stagger over the bridge on her way home, but tragically, she would never make it home. 16-year-old Warren Glawatowski and 15-year-old Kelly Ellard followed Rena over the bridge, and they continued to assault her until she was unconscious. At this point in time, they each grabbed an ankle and dragged Rena to the water. Warren said that he let go and Kelly pulled Rena into the gorge until she was waist deep in the water. And here she drowned Rena. Rena's body wasn't found until eight days later on November 22nd. Her ultimate cause of death was drowning, but the severity of her head wounds were atrocious and she likely would have died anyway had she not been drowned. Her injuries were consistent with a victim of a car crash. Because of the severity of what Warren and Kelly had done, they were tried as adults. The other six who were arrested were sentenced to 60 days up to one year. Warren and Kelly were convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after seven years. In June of 2007, Warren met privately with Rena's parents and apologized for his actions and her death. And in an extraordinary act of forgiveness, they did accept his apology. He was granted full parole in 2010. 
Kelly went on to have two children while in the prison system. She has since changed her name to Carrie Marie Sim. According to parole documents, she's currently living in a community-based residential facility, and her parole was extended for another six months. The community was stunned with the fact that eight teenagers could be involved in such a vicious act, most of them being girls. Rena Virk was a young teenage girl just in going to school like a regular person, and she was bullied for her weight, you know, the typical things like, she just wasn't the like A-list celebrity popular student girl. These girls like came together and basically took her under this bridge and started fighting with her. They ended up killing her. And I'm saying they because it's a little bit unclear who ended up being the person who like emmed her. That became a whole big thing recently because recently there was a show that came out about the case, her story, and we're just like finding out a bunch of things that we didn't know before. They basically all got away with it and they're like living fine. So I think that's like what's striking a lot of raging people now because they're like finding these people on Facebook who like end her. But it's just such an atrocious thing. Like, and that's why the show is called Under the Bridge because that's where the atrocity happened. Guilty, not guilty. What's it called? Mistrial. That's what we said last episode. So mistrial. What are you doing? What are you giving? What's your overall thoughts on the case? Judge Tati. You're a mute pookie butt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're a mute. <laughs> So given the details of the case, they came down to the fact that they wind up trying two of the kids out of the group because those two, um, when Rena ran away after she was jumped by them, um, two students actually pulled her back and they were the ones that like officially emmed her. So they were the ones who were convicted, but they got out really early and really after, early. Yeah. Really, really. One of them, it was a it was a boy and it was a girl, and the girl wind up having two babies while in prison. I wouldn't have had them get out at all. Doesn't matter that they were kids. You at that at that age, they know right from wrong. You don't just end somebody for no reason. I from the video that you sent, I think it was said that she that Rena um actually exposed like not exposed but made up some rumor that it was this girl that she was kind of jealous of or was just like a popular girl maybe and she spread rumors about her that she had yeah that's allegedly yeah what happened yeah i just wanted to get a little bit more clarity on the case because it started out like everything was happening to rena Correct? So like it started out with her yes. just being bullied and everybody just being mean to her. Because I thought the video said it was the other way around. If I'm not mistaken. It's hard to know because it's a lot of hearsay. Like some people said that Rena was the one who was like being mean to the Yeah, mean, like, they said that was she mean girl. was kind of like making herself the outcast. That's why I'm like Yeah. It's a little bit unclear. And she and that's what I did here too, that she's I mean, they could have just gaslighted her. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it led to somebody and that's crazy. Because that happens in schools all the time. That happens all the time. Like even if she was like this bitch that was like, Oh my god, Rena, she's she's the mean one. It don't matter. It's just the fact that she was running away from being, you know, assaulted in the first place and these two students decided to pull her back. And actually finish off, you know. I wonder if the goal low key was really to take her life because when they autopsied her body, they did say that a lot of her injuries was related to like if she got into a car accident. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they said then, that even if she, even if they didn't pull her into the water and she probably would have just her, passed away, she anyway. would have died from her injuries either way. Whoever the hell I would have been able to catch. The motherfuckers would have been in jail. I'm sorry. That's why I also don't understand why they didn't um, arrest and try all of the students that were there, not just the two that actually. Yeah, like what the fuck? I'm getting because these whole. Are y'all kidding me? Before the drowning, then that means exactly. they all um, had a hand. Yeah. So it should have been all of them arrested, not just the two. I wonder if 
her like being her ethnicity that she was also played into mm -hmm. her not getting the fair amount of justice because if you ask me that's not fair and like Kina said even it because from the the TikTok kind of doesn't really paint her fully as a victim and I'm not getting at yeah, the, TikTok, the, the I'm not getting at the TikToker that made the video because for, for all I know they could have just been going on information they researched and put together mm -hmm. but um the the TikTok video wasn't even painting Rena as a victim they, they it was almost kind of like a cause and effect that they yeah um, like she kind of put herself in that yeah but like Kina said even if she was this big old bitch and you don't even know if she's just getting gaslighted you know what I mean like we don't know that they they could have gaslit the entire situation to make it seem like they mm -hmm. were so justified even though they damn sure weren't even if she was a problem Problem, like to not talk to her anymore I like that would be the kid thing to do not you know there's a psychopath in that little group it is or they all yeah. are or mm -hmm. something's going on because this girl is being a problem we need to delete her yeah like to me the me that's to me that's not mentally okay i have something to say about the mindset of all those teenagers because of what the fuck was y'all doing yeah, because i think all of the kids were white kids and then a lot of the time, <laughs> kids understand that they cannot go to prison for life if they commit a crime. Like you can sentence a child to life, but they can still put them out when they're 18 That's or when they're 21. Like one of them, I think they were tried, they were sentenced to life eligible for parole after seven years. So maybe after seven years, she was maybe 18 or 21. A lot of kids understand that they cannot go to prison for life since they're Minors. I hate to have to do this. I know we're annoying, but Lord knows they did a similar episode. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did. There was this girl. She was a popular girl, and she was M'd. Um, and later on in the episode, after a uh, further investigation and just like evidence and like what was left on the girl's body, they found out that the girl's own posse actually mm -hmm. M'd her. Mm -hmm. um, like her own like little group, like her a friend. Yeah. And there was a lot of people who didn't really care about her life being she taken was away a bully. Mm -hmm. because she was a bully. She was a mean bitch. She was mean to everyone. She was a mean so bitch. Nobody really felt bad bad everything could have just been straight if y'all just would have not talked to her or avoided her or you know told the teacher and i don't condone bullying in any aspect but i would have rather y'all just surface oh, level yeah. and bullied her <laughs> they just and, you know like you know like to me it but was that's the thing with people with antisocial personality disorder and the herd mentality that's how m's are done in groups because this one person you know is a sociopath or whatever it may be and then they are like, yo, let's do this because we hate her. And then they just tag on. And who want to bet that it wasn't the two people that stayed? <laughs> they could sweep a black kid up. I'm not, <laughs> girl, they did that to her. Imagine a black kid. Mm -mm. It wouldn't have even been on the news. It would have even been a case. It would have to been something that on Twitter would have to scavenge up. There's actually a few episodes of Law and Order yes, that there's a few. circles around <laughs> that. A group of friends assaults you know another um kid and really the idea stemmed from one of the kids who is a sociopath and the others just follow why i don't know but You're right so we're giving this case guilty all the way and I, okay. i'm so <laughs> upset that the other kids wasn't even arrested involved but. yeah like that's crazy this girl and her boyfriend both of her parents in the most brutal way. They met and fell in love at university before committing one of the most horrific crimes you're likely to ever hear. They seem to be normal, really intelligent people who you wouldn't expect would be capable of doing what they did. Both of them came from wealthy, super powerful families though, so maybe they thought they could just get away with anything. What happened to the parents massively shook the community, especially the poor law enforcement that had to turn up to the Haysom household and find the bodies. In the documentary, we see some really graphic pictures from the scene of the crime. It's like something from a horror film. Genuinely, I felt sick watching it. It was also rumored that the couple practiced some kind of ritual during the to try and hypnotize the parents. Freaky. It's not a spoiler to say that it's obvious from the start that the couple definitely did the but what is so weird is that their stories keep changing throughout the whole thing. This new Netflix documentary tells the story of Elizabeth Haysom and Yen Suring. You're gonna have to watch it for yourself, but this is one of the best true crime stories I've ever heard. Okay, so basically it's about this couple who were in school at the time, so they're also very young. Another case about very young people, about 19, and it's a girl and a guy. 
and they're obsessed with each other, like madly in love, writing letters to each other, because this case happened in 1984, and the name was Jens Soaring. He was a German citizen who was going to school in the U.S., and the girl, her name, I think all I know is that she's from the Haysom family. That's I can't remember her first name right now. This was a brutal end. The girl's parents, the Haysom parents, Mr. and Mrs. Haysom, were brutally and the throat of the father was so deep that his voice box was injured that his voice box was like unusable this is part of the reason why they found out that the boyfriend had lied for the girlfriend remember who he was obsessed with saying that he had a parent but that was a lie the daughter decayed her own parents right and she was such a good manipulator that she manipulated the boyfriends into confessing for her because he was so madly in love with her. He fed into that. And I mean, it's also on Netflix and it made me just like so shocked. So I just, she's very good at being manipulative and she managed to get him to go to prison for 33 years. SV also dealt with people like that a lot. <laughs> if you ask me, ain't no amount of the world that could make me go to prison for 33 years but that's just me i thought that they were both in on the thing it, it seemed like he was a victim of it too and these were her parents or his her parents i believe not only does she need jail but she needs um a padded room with shades a juicy juice <laughs> <laughs> they don't even th that one girl on Criminal Minds that I like to read and like she was super dangerous like she yes. had to be <laughs> obsessed she but like, guys she manipulated everybody because she took the guy and they both drove like to different places drove like 600 miles to different places while they were on the run and then they ran out of money like he was really in on this so that it made it look like he was the assailant like he just looked more guilty because he was an outcast oh my God, in school. Because she just she used made everything like against him. She oh. made it like that. And she was she was also very beautiful. So people would I don't know why that's even relevant, but she's very beautiful. And people would use that to kind of say like, oh my gosh, she's innocent and she's just this innocent mm -hmm. little white girl. And her parents were I mean it was like all over the floor. I think we need to separate this are we giving the boyfriend guilty, the boyfriend specifically, like aside from her, are we giving the boyfriend guilty, not guilty, or a mistrial? I would say guilty because, I don't know. <laughs> Off the fact that he didn't physically do it, not guilty. However, once you witness a crime and you don't report it, you're automatically an accomplice. Aiding and abetting, I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Even though that was a little bit by force, but um, I'll give that parole um i think hush yeah, I think like, probably like a little year or two i feel like with a good lawyer and a, and separating the case i wonder i wonder if it was separated how you say with a good little alexandra cabot <laughs> <laughs> right it could have been argued that you know he did not physically do the crime he was manipulated by a psychopath i'm i'm guessing he did not have a great lawyer but you know 30 years is kind of insane given the fact so, that he did not even do though it. he didn't do anything yeah, yeah like, she would write him letters talking about how much she hated her parents she just wished that one day they would lay down and not wake up just weird stuff up. and he would like respond like oh yeah babes like i'll do anything you want so it, it did not look good for him and also the only thing that he could be that i would put him in jail for was obviously lying to the law enforcement because he did a false confession like three times because he was so madly in love with this girl and he was 19 and he was being stupid and yeah he thought that this was the love of his life and all that bullshit so that's the only thing i would put him in jail for there was no evidence linking him to the crime other than that he had type o and that was found on the mc but like she she was just very genius because i know his background that was like, her own was he so but y'all said that he was foreign right like he wasn't even from the u.s he was german he was german i could kind of see then why it was kind of easy to manipulate him because if you bring a foreign person who's not used to the country who's not used to anything this is like the first people this is the first american person he's interacting with he probably doesn't speak all the way english if not confidently you know what i mean like i don't know like i'm trying to look at but it and again the fact that she wrote him letters and he yeah. was agreeing with the fact that she wanted to unalive her parents. It's like, I want to know his background. Why is he a people pleaser? Like, what is going on?
Yeah, people Egypt, pleaser is crazy. <laughs> people pleaser to the fucking extreme. <laughs> the hundredth power because nobody could manipulate me to like no. What? Some people are very weak minded and maybe when they're me, in love. Yeah, and maybe in me and knowing how could, the legal could, system. Could. Absolutely not. I'm not doing prison time for nobody. Nobody. <laughs> nobody. nobody. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's an emotional case that you've probably seen on Netflix. Take Care of Maya is a popular documentary that's captivated people around the world. The Kowalski family filed a $200 million lawsuit against John Hopkins All Children's Hospital for allegedly pushing the mother of then nine-year-old Maya Kowalski to commit. Here's what happened. Maya was admitted into the hospital in July 2015 for severe pain and significant weakness. Maya was later diagnosed with a neuropathic disease. To treat the disease, doctors began to administer ketamine treatments, which reportedly caused her symptoms to improve. But a year later, Maya began experiencing more pain. Maya's mother, Beata Kowalski, allegedly insisted the hospital give Maya more ketamine, and her persistence alarmed hospital staff, so they reported it to the child abuse hotline. During opening statements of the civil trial, the hospital hospital's attorney noted several staff believe Beata Kowalski suffered from Munchausen by proxy. For those of you who don't know, Munchausen by proxy is basically when a caregiver makes up fake symptoms to make whoever they're taking care of look sick, but they're not. A judge later ordered Maya to be sheltered at the hospital while her case was sorted out and Maya was unable to see her family or go to another facility for treatment. More than 80 days of not being able to see her daughter, Beata Kowalski took her own life and left a note saying she could no longer take the pain. Now it's up to jurors to decide if what happened to the Kowalski family could have been prevented and if the hospital's actions led to Maya's mother's. We'll keep you updated on the latest from the trial right here at Law and Crime. So um, Maya Kowalski, she developed like a neuro disease that it caused her pain. I think still to this day, they're even not really sure about what it is, but it's something that really causes her pain. Her parents admitted her to John Hopkins um, Hospital. Mind you, like, we're going to like go back a little. When she first started to um, feel these pains, they um, admitted her to a few hospitals and they couldn't figure out what it was. So um, her parents wind up taking her to a doctor that was in, I believe, in Mexico. And they wind up finding like a cure, not a cure, but like a something that would help her pain. And it was ketamine. So they were giving her doses of ketamine and it was actually helping her. Um, I forget why, but the documentary is on Netflix. It's called Take Care of Maya. The ketamine was helping her. One day it got worse. So um, they weren't in Mexico. They weren't scheduled to go back, you know, so they had needed something to for right now. So they admitted her to John Hopkins Hospital, which was close by. And while they were in the hospital, the mom, Maya's mom, her name is Bieta, Bieta Kowalski. She told the nurses and the doctors, like, this is what she's been getting. Um, she's been getting ketamine. And, you know, they she explained to them her whole medical breakdown. They took that as Maya being um, medically neglected, tried to say that her mom had Munchausen disease by proxy. And they reported it to like the child, um, child abuse hotline and they wind up getting Maya taken out of her parents custody legally so physically she was in the hospital because she was sick but her parents could not visit her like she was under the care of the state this went on I believe for about like 80 days and then her mom wind up um committing the mom wind up unaliving herself because it was too much on her making her out to be falsely something that she wasn't when she really she was just trying to fight for her daughter come to find out um like when you watch the netflix series well the netflix documentary you will see at the end john hopkins hospital actually has a lawsuit on them that they've done this to like hundreds of families cut their kids away from them mm -hmm. they would report the um the parents as medical child neglect and they would get the parents taken out of their custody while the children were in the hospital they actually have a few cases if you look it up they're being sued i don't know if they're being sued right now in 2024 but i know for this case sp specifically i think they just settled maybe like a year or two ago there's just so much to break down here so john hopkins is that the hospital we would see on the commercials yes the john hopkins children's hospital did they explain why the hospital had this agenda to, to um no really when it got to like the end of the documentary the documentary was about maya's family about maya but then towards the end of the documentary they started they um put in some other families who went through the same thing 
Don't know why. Don't I know mean, what they're I'm thinking like, is it like more money or like more of a look for them to? I have, have no idea. Mind you, I've even seen, I honestly just saw a Facebook post the other day about a woman. I don't think she's going through it with John Hopkins, but it's a specific hospital. I think she's in North Carolina or South Carolina that that hospital also has a history of um, reporting parents for medical child neglect and getting this um, children taken out of the family's care. Only this woman is going through it like way worse. Like is the little is the little girl okay now? Like the, was yeah. She- well, when it got to the end of documentary, she still has I forget what it's called, but she still the has the neural brain. disease. Yeah, it was like something that came out of nowhere. They don't really exactly know what it is. And basically, as a parent, they went all over to find out how to, you know, cure this or maintain it or, you know, figure out what dad still in her life. Yes. And where the hell was he during all of this? He was the same. He was going through it just as much as the mom. Like, um, so Maya has mom, dad and a little brother, I believe. I think she's the oldest. So I think the the, um, her brother is younger than her. Um, The dad was just as much involved, you know. So after their mom unalived herself, you know, it's just him and the two kids. Um, and they went on to um, sue the hospital. Come to find out the neural disease that Maya has is real. Um, they interviewed the doctor that they went to in Mexico. The doctor, um, you know, spoke on it. And the doctor went down the case plan of what they did to help Maya and everything. And like everything was real. She did not have Munchausen by proxy. Was yeah. actually trying to just help her daughter. Uh, any good psychiatrist could detect whether yeah. or not a parent mm-hmm. has Munchausen's, right? Uh, probably I'm watching too much TV because I feel like a quick little therapy session or a little evaluation. Yeah, you can see like clear when, mm-hmm. you okay. can see the discrepancies and things like that when it comes to that. And it wasn't that. Because even offering them like here is the doctor's information that we went to. And that's my second thing. Y'all are so quick to accuse the mom. Why are y'all not corroborating the information that y'all are being given? Any Mm -hmm. typical hospital would have to do. Call the doctor that y'all went to through Mm so-and-so to discuss things with them. People in the medical field see something that they have not learned in the textbooks. They think it's not real. The human body, like, humans period things could come out of nowhere and they, we don't know what the hell it is so the, they did so many tests on her and the mom mind you the mom is an rn she was a registered nurse for years she was telling them like oh you're doing this test but you're not going to find anything because we did it already it's like they didn't really look back at the past records they were just doing their own thing and made it to seem like she was crazy even at one point after the little girl was like legally taken out of her parents' care, they even had a therapist come to the hospital. This is according to the documentary. They had a therapist come to the hospital to speak to Maya because they started to say that Maya was lying about her pain, that she's not in pain, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with her. This is really f- sad. Isn't that like kidnapping in a way? They're just doing it legally. Like they literally banned her family, not even just the mom, her mom, her dad, and her brother from seeing Maya. So this affected not only Maya's family, but Maya herself, because she wanted to see her mom. She wanted to see her dad, her brother. Like, this is what I'm saying, like from me watching the documentary, they even limited like the amount of phone calls that she can have with Maya. Maya could barely speak to her parents, could barely speak to anybody. Wow. Because they're trying to shape the narrative to make it seem like the mom really had Munchausen's. Yeah. They Mm -hmm. want Maya to say she's not in pain. That she's fine, yeah. Now Maya really is in pain, even to this day. It would be pain to the point where she couldn't move, where she couldn't walk. Oh, it was like her whole body. She couldn't. Sometimes it would be headaches, too, where she would get... Like, they knew when it was getting bad. When she was getting headaches, like, they knew, like, okay, this is about to come. She, it was sometimes where her feet, like, you know how your feet could lay straight. Sometimes yeah. her feet will go in like that and she can't move them. Even her arms too. Sometimes her arms will get stiff and, and it's other things too. How can you tell her she has Munchausen and she literally has proof. She would take videos and pictures of her, of Maya. Oh, the hospital's guilty. Mm-hmm. They're guilty and they need an they are, And they also have other cases because Maya isn't the only one. Because now I'm thinking y'all are doing something to the kids themselves. Like, to me, it's oh. just like, what are y'all doing to their children? Because now I'm thinking it's kidnapping going on, possible assault. 
-hmm. because like what are y'all doing to their kids what is the what is the purpose yeah like what is the reason john hopkins like we get commercials for y'all like all the time yes. and yeah. i'm also wondering if that's yeah. pre-calculated shit y'all want us to bring our kids so y'all can take them away and that's probably why they took her to john hopkins because like everyone everyone knows john hopkins children's hospital we know it so they that's why they probably took her there because they felt like okay even though we took her to other hospitals and they didn't know what it was you know this is a good hospital like you know and exactly. these kids actually have things wrong with them and the fact that y'all don't know what it is you're gonna call cps <laughs> and while y'all are playing all of these stupid and creepy ass games these kids are still suffering yeah and they need an investigation if they didn't have one yes. already if they don't have one already, they probably do by this point because of the, how um the series, well, not the series, it's just a documentary, but how it took off. But. Oh, John Hopkins, get it together. So, like, get it together. That's because the mom, she made a note. To the point where she felt like she had to yeah, unalive she felt herself. Hopeless. I would charge the hospital too, low-key. Right. That's why they facilitated. sued. Because of, you know, the situation itself, obviously, but because what happened to her mom. I think she literally did it it was something that was sad. She did it like so Maya could be with her family or something like that. Like she felt like it is what she had to do for them to see that, like the truth. She did it in her home. I think it was in her garage. And the dad and the son had came home and found her like that. Maya was in the hospital. So she didn't even really speak to her mom that much because they limited the calls. So like she spoke to her maybe weeks before and then she got the news that wow 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 it's given like some frankenstein laboratory all right taking these kids like, like what the f are y'all doing like i'm not here for it the police also won't tell you there's a fifth amendment loophole don't talk if you don't have to there was a case once where a citizen started talking to the police and then he became uncomfortable during the conversation so he just immediately went silent. But the police kept asking him questions and then come to find out the police tried to write it down to interpret that his silence meant that he was somehow guilty of what they were saying. The police in this case proceeded forward, the district attorney's office proceeded forward, and even the Supreme Court ruled that if you start speaking to the police and then you remain silent, that silence could be used as an implicit admission to what the police are asking you. That means if you started talking to the police, you better make sure and speak up by saying, I wish to remain silent, I will not answer any questions, and then stay silent. Because otherwise, if you start talking and then you remain silent, they could try to use your silence against you. So you should always announce your right to remain silent and that you're invoking the Fifth Amendment and shut up. We suck this isn't so much of a case, but more so of a breakdown of the Fifth Amendment. It's inspired by a case, but it didn't specify what case. This is an unknown case, by the way, y'all. Mm -hmm. I guess something happened, something criminal. A witness came forth to speak on the situation that happened. He was getting questioned by the police. And eventually, throughout the questioning, he started to feel uncomfortable. That's when he stayed silent. He didn't say anything else. What we don't know that they say is like a loophole with the Fifth Amendment, even though you do have the right to remain silent, if you come forth with information and you start talking, but then decide to stop talking, literally, you can be accused of a crime. Obstruction, right? Yeah. Something like, like that. Yeah. Like any accusations that they're making, you can be accused of it if you decide to stop talking to them so they were making him feel uncomfortable he didn't want to talk anymore so they were trying to arrest him for the crime and that's the loophole so if you want to remain silent on something you have to verbally say i invoke my fifth amendment right to remain silent and then that's it but since he didn't say those words they had the right to accuse him of the crime did that he go to jail it didn't specify um I don't think he did, but it didn't specify if he did. The f turns these cases have been taken, I would be surprised if he got a year or two. Right, right. Or obstruction of, you know, not saying right. much more. We you know how police are. Uh, guilty, not guilty, or a mistrial. Not guilty because these amendments and these rights and these laws, they always have a loophole for the other side. Like, it's never a loophole really for the people. It's like, okay, yeah, you have a Fifth Amendment, but it's always a but. Because every situation is different and humans are going to do something intentionally or unintentionally mm -hmm. to challenge what's written on paper. That brings me with this Trump situation. 
the fact that Trump can be found guilty on all 34 counts, yet he can still run for president and he can still vote for himself. However, a convicted felon cannot vote. Because that shit don't make no sense to me. Right. That's where another loophole. Like, make this make sense. The this math is, is not mathing. <laughs> like, the math is not mathing. Tati, you were the one who created this game. And we've been playing this game for the last couple of episodes. And I feel like this episode was like the deepest we've ever gotten with yeah. it. You know, mm -hmm. and it's also making me have like a, a, a like this another level of appreciation for shows like SVU and Criminal Minds because f to be the people that actually have to be hands on with these cases and investigate yeah. them, it, like this is scary. It is, and definitely these cases, well, at least the first three, just made me so so scared as a parent. <laughs> like, like, damn, <laughs> scary, especially with the last one with the Maya situation. It's like. Damn, I gotta be scared to take my kid to go get to the hospital when there's <laughs> like, already. This is why so many people yeah. are just so ready to do holistic things. This is why you have families that don't even believe in taking their kids oh, to the hospital. Dude, and now crazy. they're justified with stuff like this. Also, if you guys have any thoughts, I don't think I usually say this for my podcast episodes, but if you guys have any thoughts, any opinions on everything that we spoke about, please write in the comments how y'all feel and definitely let us know. Me, Tati, Deborah, and Kino would love to hear y'all opinions on things. Um, stay tuned for everything else that I have coming forward. Um, I just want to keep doing what I love. Don't forget again to check out the mixtape and check out Tati's little business things that she got going on. Definitely. Okay. Instagram for that. We are just trying to grind and really make real moves out here. We are going to go. I love you guys, and we'll definitely catch y'all on the next one. All right. There's a difference between hearing and listening. You get it. Our passion, a spirit, our devotion. We're making magic.